Today, I'm going to try to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Soul Silver with only Electric type Pokemon. I'm not going to lie, I'm a bit nervous about this one as Electric types are kind of strange. They've got great offensive and speed stats, but their defenses are atrocious, and beyond that, I think the biggest problem we're going to face might be the lack of coverage moves that they have, especially in earlier generations. With that said, we do have a cool variety of possible encounters, some of which we've never gotten to use, but there certainly aren't many of them in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, so I I suspect this will be a tough one. Let's see if we can beat Pokemon Soul Silver with only the first electric type that we find on each route, no items in battle, level caps in place, and the battle mode on set at all times. Alright, here we go, time to jump back into the remakes that were released 12 years ago. Dear lord, I'm old. Oh hey look, Professor Oak's got a jacket to match our electric theme. Looking good, my dude. Not only that, but it looks like he's also brought a water type along for us to practice killing with ease. How thoughtful. Now, I've always thought this whole shrinking down to size sequence looks incredibly painful, but I realized we're just Ant-Man. That's the only explanation. <laughs> Another one? Time to kill- No, no, hey, what the f***? Chill, that's my Pokemon. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I just love killing Merrills. For our starter Pokemon, there are of course no electric types, but I'm going to choose Totodile. No, not because it's my favorite, but rather because this will give our rival Chikorita, and with grass resisting electric, it will likely give us the greatest challenge. Speaking of our rival, outside of Cherry Grove City, he challenges us to battle, and with him having no grass moves yet, it really wasn't all that challenging. One thing I don't get though, is that he says he wants to be a world famous Pokemon trainer, but is scared of giving his name out? My dude, you, you do realize what famous means, right? With the police asking about him, I decide to divulge that his name was not blue. Get it? He's certainly not blue, but he's also not red either. I mean, his hair is red, but he's actually silver. Okay, you know what? Never mind. I'm sure the police will at least appreciate my detective work. On the route ahead, Lyra gives us some Pokeballs, meaning our run has officially begun, but we don't have any viable electric encounters quite yet. Along the way, our mom calls us to ask if she should save our money, and if you're doing a Nuzlocke of your own, definitely have her do this as she can buy some fantastic items for you, some of which we'll hopefully see later. With that, we arrive in the first gym location, Violet City. Now, interesting fact, in the Pokemon Center here, there's this dude named Primo who you can get some pretty cool Pokemon from that you can't otherwise get by telling him passwords. But many of you might not know that this is actually the Tichi TV guy from Fire Red and Leaf Green. Cool continuity. Thankfully, the route south of Violet is open to us, Route 32, as this has our first viable electric encounter. None other than a Mareep, which oddly enough was completely unobtainable in Pokemon Crystal. I still don't understand why they would ever do that. We catch it successfully and name him Shazam, and Shazam has a relaxed nature giving him plus defense and minus speed stats. Meh. Ironically enough, the only way to EV train Shazam in special attack is actually against fellow Mareep. A rather cruel thing to force him to do, but we have no choice and it's actually quite difficult and tedious with both Pokemon always having the static ability. At the top of the Sprout Tower, Not Blue and I gang up and beat up an elderly man. Okay, not really, but I do battle him. Now unfortunately, he has two Grass-type Bellsprouts, which means our stat moves are resisted, so we have to stick with Tackle. Vine Whip does a good chunk on us each turn, but with the paralysis from our ability, we're able to take down the first one with two-thirds health remaining before leveling up. And the second brought us all the way down to just 14 HP. This is a way more dangerous battle than I was expecting. His final Pokemon is a flying type, Hoot Hoot, but our Thundershock doesn't even do enough. Then he hits a Hypnosis to put us to sleep. Not good at all, but miraculously we only got hit once by Peck before waking up on the second turn to finish the battle. Gotta say, that battle is rarely difficult, but this time it certainly was. It's time for the Violet City Gym, and I'm very grateful you can skip all the trainers in here as we needed the levels for the Elder. The gym leader here is Faulkner, a flying type trainer, so I'm feeling pretty darn good about our odds, but I'm not getting too cocky. He leads with a Pidgey, and Sand Attack is never a fun time, but he just went for Tackle, so a single Thundershock obliterates him in one hit. Alrighty then. In comes the big threat though, Pidgeotto. His best move against us is Tackle, and we hit him right to half right away, but then he uses Roost to heal. But not only does this heal him, but it also gets rid of his flying type temporarily, so Thundershock does less, meaning we are actually not in a good position. But our static ability paralyzes him on his next tackle, meaning after he hit one to the red, we then outspeed on the next turn, being able to KO him with those two consecutive attacks. Whew. 
That could have actually been worse than I realized. Roost was a game changer there, but we had a fairly decent shot at paralyzing between Static and Thundershock at least. First badge acquired. After picking up the mystery egg in the Mart, some random woman comes up to us outside and says, Now I get it. That egg is a truly important egg. Please do take good care of it for me. Is that understood? I'm counting on you. I don't even know who you are. Now, with very few electric encounters in this game, I'm grateful for one thing, the Pokewalker, a device which allows you to catch new Pokemon in different areas by walking with it. And in the suburban area, after 500 watts and 5,000 steps, we can find an Elekid, which I nicknamed Thor and who has a docile, neutral nature and already has the Thunder Punch move, too. Incredible. Oh, I can't wait to go on our adventure together, little buddy. Oh, huh. He kind of looks miserable, doesn't he? and is apparently tired. Great. Now, what would a run in these games be if we didn't hit up the ruins of Alf to break some rocks? Landing us some colored shards, which we can exchange at the guy outside of the Violet Poke Center for some incredible berries, even citrus berries this early on in our adventure. It's the little things like this that really help these runs. After offering us a slow poke tail for $1 million and us politely declining, this guy says, and I thought kids these days were loaded. Nope, just Mr. Beast. Rock Smash isn't done delivering the goods yet though, as we can pick up the Shell Bell item too before very much dodging the hell out of this guy with a Geodude team. He would literally destroy us right now. Not the day. As it turns out, in the Slowpoke well, Thor is fantastic against Team Rocket with Thunder Punch obliterating their Zubats and Rattatas left and right. Up ahead in Azalea Town, there are Slowpoke everywhere and it's tempting. They are water types after all, but we're gonna hit up the Azalea Gym. Shazam does amazing in here with relatively good bulk for an unevolved Pokemon and with Bug being hit neutrally by Electric. And along the way we get even more bulk as he evolves into a Flappy at level 15. The second gym leader is Bugsy, the Bug Specialist who has a level 17 Scyther of all things and if I'm honest, we could lose this easily. We just have to hope for a particular sequence of moves that he uses, otherwise there's just no way. Let's see how it goes. I lead with Shazam first, and Electric is super effective against him, but yup, he goes for U-turn immediately for right about half before Metapod comes in, and we hit our Thundershock for over half. Well, I mean, at least we can KO that thing now. But in comes Scyther again, and I'm hoping we have enough bulk here. But we don't have to worry for now, as he goes for Focus Energy instead. And we did get a crit on Thundershock before his berry. He then goes for Quick Attack, and we have to hope for no crit. And thank god he doesn't get one, so our Citrus Berry helps before Thundershock just barely doesn't KO. But we do paralyze him. However, he then uses a Super Potion to full before we don't even do half. Goodness gracious, that range was brutal. I have no choice now, as a U-turn would end us, so I switch into Thor, knowing that he could outspeed and do enough with Thunder Punch potentially, but he makes it through Paralysis for U-turn, but no crit, so we survive on 13 HP before a berry and can slam the incoming Kakuna with two more to end his existence, just getting hit by one poison sting in the process. It all comes down to this, the final part of my plan, and it works as we outsped and got the higher damage range with a better move than Shazam's Thundershock. Wow, that switch into Thor was crucial, but with the higher crit ratio, nothing was a guarantee. The threats are not over yet though, as before leaving the town we have a battle with Not Blue, and he now has a Bayleaf which resists our stab moves. Yikes. Coming up with a plan though, it's time to give it a shot. He leads with a Ghastly, so I lead with Thor, one of the few things that can outspeed it, and with the physical move we can one hit KO it before it can try any nonsense on us. And amazingly, the same goes for his Zubat too. Then in comes the Bayleaf. Thor is useless out there, so I switch in Shazam who gets hit with a Poison Powder. Not ideal. A Razor Leaf then hits us for a good chunk before we land the Thunder Wave to paralyze. Now that we outspeed, I go for Growl to lower the power of non-crit Razor Leafs, and he goes for Reflect. Hmm. I Growl again, then he hits us with another, and it hardly does anything, although it is a high crit ratio move. Just to get some damage, I Thundershock, but it hardly does anything, and he makes it through Paralysis again, and at this point, I know I need to switch. With his lowered attack, I'm hoping this might be possible, but he also has Synthesis too to heal. 
Knowing Reflect is up still, I take the time to use Leer, then once it goes down, I start hitting him with Thunder Punch. As soon as he sets up Reflect again, I then Leer. This way, we bait him into using Synthesis while lowering his defense, and that, combined with the Paralysis, allows us to start doing some big damage even with a resisted move, and we take him down in a few hits with Thor not taking much damage at all. Oh, I think that was the only way that was possible. Ah, another day, another sequence of chasing down a terrified Farfetch'd with electric types. Mwah, gotcha! Ah, you. Golden Rod City is next upon us, the biggest city in the game, and here we can get some great things, such as the Protect, Light Screen, and Reflect TMs in the department store. But not only that, after wasting thousands on the Drawing Center, we could also get the number one prize, the Flash Cannon TM, which should be stellar for a later encounter of ours. Hey, hey, tell him to do the thing. Oh, big boy! Now, the game corner here has some stellar prizes, including the Thunderbolt TM even, but I can't possibly tolerate grinding this out right now, so we'll come back later. With that, it's time for the Goldenrod City Gym, and the trainers in here were quite manageable with Shazam having some great bulk now. The third gym leader, though, is definitely an infamous one, Whitney, the normal type specialist. You all know what's coming, and with some theory crafting under our belt, let's just hope and pray that we survive. She leads with a Clefairy, which is always terrifying with Metronome, as we've had some bad rolls with it, and Thundershock actually does very little. She just went for Mimic first turn, so we could hit her below half before she Metronomes, and gets Gunk Shot. Not terrible. Another Thundershock barely doesn't KO, but here comes what I was hoping for, Double Slap, as every hit has a chance to paralyze it, meaning even after she super potions, we can take advantage of paralysis by switching to Headbutt, thereby going for a paraflinch combo, and it works pretty well, taking her down with us having most of our health. In comes the bane of our existence though, Miltank. She hits us with Stomp low before our berry, and then we land a Growl to lower her attack. She went for a tract on the next turn and we stayed immobilized, but then on her next stomp, she got paralyzed, but her lumberry heals her. And we flinched too. Are you kidding me? Another stomp hits us to the red, and it paralyzed her again. Yes, but we stay immobilized again. I have to switch here, so I go into Thor as she stays paralyzed. Here, I start using Leer to lower her defense, and with her paralyzed, with lowered attack, and with lowered defense, and with us having super effective low kick, we can avoid stomp flinches since we outspeed, and we made it through the attract and her healing to take her down in the end with over half remaining after our berry. Unbelievable. That worked out pretty damn well, and I'm glad we didn't have to force a thunder wave as expected. And after all that, Whitney won't give us the damn badge. Gonna cry. With the third badge behind us, we can now get an amazing event Pokewalker encounter from the Yellow Forest after 9,500 steps, a Pikachu, which I nicknamed Miguel and who also has a neutral nature. Not only that, but this special Pikachu also has Surf as one of its moves. That's right, a surfing Pikachu. Now technically we could have also gotten a light ball from the Yellow Forest, but I think that would be against our transferring item rules and would be incredibly OP, so we'll refrain from going that far. Uh, the Quick Claw is a very nice gesture lady, but I don't think we'll be needing that with an electric team. But what we might need is the Dig TM in the secret part of the National Park. Nice. Up ahead, there's the Sudowoodo battle, and I was like, ha, huh, I think we've got this. You but Surf doesn't even do enough somehow, and it turns out he has Flail, which increases in power the more he's hurt, and Miguel survives on just 2 HP. Holy, that was close. I had no idea he had Flail. Whoops. Ah, the delicious irony that when we get to Ecrutic City, we can normally get the Surf HM for the first time here, but somehow we managed to get a legitimate encounter with Surf already on it before even getting Surf, and without trading someone who was further in the game too. Too good. In the Pokemon Center here, we have a key moment as we meet Bill for the first time, who we'll actually need for our next encounter. Huh, a Shadow Claw TM. I sure do wish this was Shadow Ball instead. I'm going to rehearse at the dance theater. Care to join me? Ladies and gentlemen, we scored the date. Well, it's a trip back to Goldenrod now that Bill has returned home as he gives us our next encounter, an Eevee, which I named Flash and who has a jolly plus speed and minus special attack nature. Pretty brutal. We don't even need any extra speed on a future Jolteon and minus special attack? Ugh. Oh well, let's go Pikachu and Eevee. 
While heading back up north, I realized that the Pokeathlon is now open, and... Oh boy, that Polyrath backwards glance, he really doesn't like electric types, does he? Now it turns out, on Thursdays only, you can get the Thunderstone as a prize before the National Dex, so naturally, it's time to grind out some speed courses to get the required points. Eventually, we get enough for two Thunderstones, meaning we get new evolutions as Miguel evolves into a Surfing Raichu, epic, and Flash also evolves into a Wicked Fast Jolteon. Seriously, with a jolly nature, nothing will outspeed this thing. I also finally committed to the Game Corner grind, meaning we could get a Thunderbolt TM, and also the Metronome item to power up moves that are used consecutively. Next up, we do have another battle with Not Blue, and to be honest, I'm not feeling great about it. But while planning, I realized we could still get one more encounter. As to the east, Route 38 is open, and in no time we find it, a Magnemite, which I catch and nickname Ultron. Ultron has a bold plus attack and minus defense nature. Again, not great, but that part steel typing should definitely come in handy. It's the Burn Tower where our next rival battle is to be found, and I'm feeling a bit more comfortable with Ultron on our side now. To begin with, I pull off the same strat with Thor against Ghastly for the KO, but then he brings out Bayleaf, which threw a little bit of a wrench into my plan. However, Ultron is the perfect switch, resisting grass, not being able to be poisoned, and can bypass a Reflect 2 with Sonic Boom, which does a set 20 HP damage every time. He is literally the Bayleaf Destroyer, perfectly designed to handle it as we take him down, hardly taking any damage after our berry. But, I completely forgot, he has his own Magnemite now, which Magnet Pole traps us on the field. Oh no. With Sonic Boom, he could take us down in two hits from this range. We hit him below half, then he Thunder Waves us, then outspeeds to confuse with Super Sonic on the next turn. But we make it through both to KO. Oh man, we almost lost Ultron right away, but from there at least his Zubat is easy pickings. Sheesh. Oh hey, Raikou! I'd really love for you to join my electric team- Okay. It's time for the Ecrity City Gym, a ghost type gym, and this is actually incredible for us as I can use Flash who I taught the Thunderbolt TM to and who outspeeds all the Ghastly and Haunter. And not only that, but all of them give special attack EVs too, so it's a perfect training opportunity. The fourth gym leader is Morty, quite a troublesome ghost type specialist who can be just as annoying as Whitney depending on your typing, but we have the perfect answer. Flash, who I put the metronome item on. The thing is, Morty is only super threatening if he outspeeds you, but Flash outspeeds everything, and his Thunderbolt increases in power every time it's used, sweeping through his Ghastly, then outspeeding and hitting his Gengar, which does survive though, but just goes for mean look, so his entire team is a progressively more powerful sweep from there. According to my calcs, even a Shadow Ball then Sucker Punch would have been tanked, the only huge danger there was a 70% accuracy hypnosis, so I I think it was a solid plan. Oh, that feels incredible after how many times we've struggled with his confusion, sleep, etc. For winning, we also get the Shadow Ball TM, which Flash can actually learn for some great type coverage, and that would have been real handy before the gym. On the way to the next city, we run into Boba, Bauba, and this is usually an exciting moment as he opens up the Safari Zone, but there isn't a single encounter available to us in there, so thanks for nothing, pal. Oh hey look, it's Cameron the photographer! Let's take a nice team photo- Oh, damn it, I, I blanked, I blanked. Can we, can we do a retake, please? After stuffing a mill tank with dozens of berries, these girls give us a seal case and some seals, but not a single lightning bolt one. Huh. Useless. Arriving in Olivine City, we're quickly stopped by Not Blue, who chastises Jasmine for worrying about the sick Ampharos and says she should just let it go. Goodness gracious, my dude out here sounding like Kylo Ren. Let the past die. Kill it, if you have to. Here we can get a crucial item for a new encounter though, as this fisherman gives us the good rod. Before setting out to capture it, we can also surf to the west a bit to find the charge beam TM, which might be useful. Route 41 is the location of our next encounter, and using the good rod we can find... a Chin Chow, which I catch and nickname Ray. Ray has a gentle, plus special defense and minus defense nature, not bad, and it should be incredibly helpful, as not only is it part water type, but also its evolution is one of the most underrated Pokemon out there in my opinion. 
With that, we arrive in Sienwood City where the next gym is, and heading straight to the gym, we can handle most of the trainers with Shazam, whose bulk helps us tank fighting moves, especially with the plus defense nature. And Static comes in clutch as they're all physical attackers. During the process, we have perhaps the most massive evolutionary haul that we've ever had, as Shazam finally fully evolves into a beautiful Ampharos for some wicked bulk and power, Ultron evolves into a Magneton to the same effect, our starter Pokemon Thor also evolves into a speedy Electabuzz, which I'm going to keep as a physical attacker. And finally, our newly caught Ray evolves into a super bulky Lantern, and also learns the stockpile move to raise his defenses. What a monster power-up of almost our entire team. It's time for the fifth gym leader, Chuck, the fighting type specialist. Ray would likely be the best choice here overall, however, he doesn't have a single good electric move yet, so I instead go with Shazam with a Citrus Berry attached. Primate goes for double team immediately, then we land a discharge for huge damage before he merely tries to go for a focus punch, but of course we can disrupt it with another attack for the KO. Then in comes his ace, Polyrath. Looks easy, right? But he gets off a of hypnosis immediately to put us to sleep, then starts charging up a massive power focus punch of his own, but we wake up in the nick of time and hit it hard to blow half after its berry. Whew. He then merely charges up another one as there's no way he's going to use Surf against us, so another attack wins what is ultimately a very clean battle. Primeape using Rock Slide and Polyrath using Body Slam instead would have been more dangerous, but in the end it seems he was seeking power at all costs. Outside the gym, Chuck's wife gives us the Fly HM and I gotta say, you're looking pretty fly yourself. At the top of the Olivine Lighthouse, we... oh, well, uh, this is awkward. As it turns out, if you bring an Ampharos up here, the two of them actually greet each other. Okay, that's incredibly cute. With no reason to delay, we're gonna hit up the Olivine City Gym right away, as I don't think we need to face Price first to conserve levels. You see, Jasmine is a Steel-type trainer, a type that we resist, and not only that, but after hitting her first Magnemite with a Stab Surf from Ray, which is neutral, in my head it's kind of weird that Steel and Electric doesn't resist water conceptually. She tried to confuse us as I thought, and I attached a Person Berry so we snap out and take it down. Her next one then survives one as well and paralyzes us with Thunder Wave, and yes, you could do that to electric types in this gen, but a few more attacks take her down as she missed her supersonic. Then comes her final Pokemon, her ace, Steelix, and being part ground type, it's weak to our surf, and she just used Screech a couple of times before we landed an attack, which immediately decimated her for the win. Go Ray, go. Six badges. Up ahead at the Lake of Rage, we can grab the hidden power TM from this guy, which might come in handy depending on our types, which I'm really hoping to pull through for us, but we can also grab one of the best items in the game here, the Choice Specs. Wicked. Facing off against the Red Gyarados, it's time to put Ultron to use and see what a Choice Specs boosted Mirror Thundershock can do. Damn, that's some power. Imagine Thunderbolt. Back in Mahogany Town, we... Huh, that's a suspicious looking tree. Hey, uh, Lance, did you see that tree us? Jesus Christ. Now, oddly enough, our next encounter comes in a very strange place, the Rocket Hideout itself, where stepping on one of the panels triggers a Pokemon, Voltorb. I tried to catch this thing in a regular Pokeball for the memes, but failed pretty hard. Mission failed. We'll get him next time. I named Voltorb Victor, and he goes automatically into the box, so we'll check his nature later. Okay, my team is not liking the looks of that at all. But we can find the Thief TM here for type boosting items, except we can't get Magnus using the wild Pokemon method for whatever reason. Well, at least the Rocket Trainers are quite easily handled in there, as ones like Petrol have Normal, Poison, and Flying types, all of which are types that Ultron deals with really effectively. As for the double battle with Lance against Ariana, well, the same thing goes, as I attach the Choice Specs on Ultron and taught him the Flash Cannon TM, so a massive power attack is able to finish off anything that gets hit with it, as Arbok's Intimidate of course didn't affect us. And the Champion of the Region then forces us to slaughter a bunch of fellow Electric types to save the region. Team, look away for a sec. Interestingly, I actually ran into a roaming Raikou while EV training, and you just know I had to give an attempt to throw a ball at it. I mean, we're not allowed to use legendaries, but still, I couldn't resist. It's an electric type. 
The Mahogany Gym is upon us, and Ultron's slaughter does not end here, as he's perfect against all the ice trainers, shattering them with a stab super effective, choice specs boosted 80 power flash cannon from a base 120 special attack Pokemon. Devastating. However, the 7th Gym Leader Price won't be quite the same story, as he has part water and part ground types on his team. I think we do have the perfect answer though. Ray, who I taught the Thunderbolt TM to. Price leads with a seal against us and we immediately nail it with a Thunderbolt for the KO. In comes Piloswine next and here we have another answer in Super Effective Surf, although it only does about 3 quarters surprisingly before he uses Hail. Then another one takes him down through his Snow Cloak ability fortunately. His final Pokemon is Dugong, quite a bulky threat as well, but we could take him down in a few attacks after he healed, only getting hurt by Hail and one Aurora Beam in the process. Heading back to the PC to check on our newly caught Victor, I realize he's got a relaxed nature for plus defense and minus speed. And you know what? That's actually not bad given that we know he'll outspeed everything anyway. Donning the rocket uniform in the Goldenrod Underground, you know what? Somehow an Electabuzz works with this theme. Oh come on, stop wandering around Thor, we're supposed to look intimidating. In the Goldenrod Radio Tower, we're tasked with downing Team Rocket, and this is one of, I think, two instances ever where we don't have to worry about Petrol's exploding coughings and wheezings, as Ultron not only resists it, but can also Choice Specs Flash Cannon his way through his entire team. What a savage piece of metal. Before long, we're challenged by Not Blue again, and his team is growing ever more powerful, but after coming up with a plan, it's time to go for it. He leads with an evolved Golbat now, so I lead with Miguel, who I realize we haven't gotten to make use of until now, as Thunderbolt eviscerates him upon impact. Then, in comes his Sneasel, and this is where the department store comes in handy, as after getting hit hard with a damn critical hit feint attack, our Barry heals us and we land a 4 times super effective Focus Blast to wipe him off the map. That crit was super unfortunate though, as in comes his now fully evolved Meganium next. I switch into Ultron as he gets Reflect up, and Flash Cannon is finally a way to do some major damage on him, as Petal Dance brings us to a third after two hits, then another takes him down for the easiest dealing with a starter that we've had. In comes Haunter next, and not wanting to get stuck out there with Mean Look and potentially Cursed, I switch in Thor who can outspeed and Thunder Punch him, then because he used Curse, we can have an easier time and take him down with another. In comes his final Pokemon, his Magnemite, and here I switch back in Miguel for Focus Blast, but he paralyzes us upon the switch. He then hits a Sonic Boom, then we miss Focus Blast. Ah. Oh. He hits another, bringing us to just 13 HP, and then we stay paralyzed. Why? Here I can switch in Ray though, who can easily handle him with a crit surf from there for the victory. Our second last rocket battle is against Ariana, and this time I put the choice specs on Flash and just went to town with a super powered Thunderbolt, taking down both her Arbok and Murkrow in one attack each, then just tanked it out against her Vileplume even though she resisted our attacks as we still did about a third and she couldn't hurt us much. And with that, it's time for the final rocket battle against Executive Archer. And feeling pretty good about Flash, I lead with him against his Hound Hour, and Choice Specs Thunderbolt indeed obliterates him. Then in comes Houndoom, who actually barely survives one in the red, then lands a Fire Fang, which hits us below half instantly and gets the burn before another takes him down. Okay, that might have been a bit rash on my part, as a crit would have done us in, but from there his coughing suffers a one-hit KO to end Team Rocket for the second time. After this, I'm going to add Victor to the team and box Flash for a particular reason. While training him up, Victor eventually evolves into an Electrode, a wickedly speedy Pokemon who I'm going to try to just add bulk and power to since we know he'll outspeed anything. Oh yes, that's right, who's a good rolly boy? Who's a good boy? Traversing through the perilous ice path is always a fun time, and near the end we did find the Never Melt Ice item, but unfortunately none of our Pokemon have hidden power ice. I checked. Regardless, we arrive in Blackthorn City where the final gym is, and the move reminder is also located here, great for Pokemon like Ultron who I can have relearn Tri-Attack which should be great in combination with the Silk Scarf from our mom. The Blackthorn gym consists of a bunch of dragon trainers who also have horses and Seedras, so it's like a water and dragon gym technically, and as it turns out, Victor's hidden power type is dragon, although it only gives 42 power. Was still a great way to handle the trainers though, especially with the bulk EV investment I gave him. The 8th and final gym leader is Claire, the dragon type specialist who happens to be vastly outclassed by her cousin by the way. Sorry, had to say it. She leads with an Intimidate Gyarados, so I lead with Victor. I was going to use Charge Beam in hopes of raising our special attack, but we missed our first attack. Damn it. 
Dragon Rage is our best way to damage us though for 40 HP damage every time, and then we hit a charge beam on the next turn which barely doesn't KO as well, but we do get the special attack raise. We've now gotten hit twice more than I thought we would. Ouch. Knowing she'll heal, I go for it again, and this time it does get the range, but no boost. In comes Dragonair next, and I am panicking a bit as we can't even paralyze these things effectively due to Shed Skin. But I get Light Screen up before she paralyzes us. Ah, so much for our speed. Aqua Tail hits us hard to a quarter, and then I try to go for Hidden Power again as she hits us again, and we survive on just 4 HP before landing one for two thirds. Sheesh. Okay, this has gone way more disastrously than I thought. From here though, I can take her down with Ultron, only taking one Aqua Tail. Then, in comes her other Dragonair, which has Fire Blast, so I have to switch. I go into Shazam, and thankfully she missed it, although she then paralyzes us immediately. Our best move here was Headbutt, so between Paralysis and Dragon Pulses, we were getting outclassed, although we did bring her to a sliver. Here I switch in Miguel though, who tanks a Dragon Pulse and can respond with a Thunderbolt KO. In comes her final Pokemon, her ace, Kingdra. Now my calcs told me we could survive a Hydro Pump from here and I really wanted the Paralysis, so I stayed in and got it immediately. But then, she not only breaks through the Paralysis, but she lands an 80% accuracy move too, and gets a Sniper Boosted Crit as well. Are you kidding me? Well, I'd rather that than her having gotten a Sniper Crit Dragon Pulse on Ray, who's the other best answer here, so I send him out and can confuse Ray her, so Thunderbolts whittle her down from there as we win the 8th badge. Quite an unfortunate Pokemon loss though. In the Dragon's Den, something occurs to me. Is this whole dragon thing supposed to be a Pokemon statue? If so, what Pokemon is it? Mega Kingdra confirmed. What the hell ever happened to Mega Evolutions, by the way? Well, it's that time again, time for what is often one of the scariest moments in these games, the five consecutive battles against the Kimono Girls with no healing. But I taught Ultron the Thunderbolt TM to achieve maximum consistent power, and with the choice specs, we're able to destroy her Umbreon and Espeon, whose typings we both resist. Then their Flareon was too frail to survive one as well. The cool thing here being, because each one is a new battle, we can technically switch up the choice specs attack that we use, so we can take down their Jolteon with relative ease, and then because we got paralyzed, it would be too risky to keep an Ultron against Vaporeon, and we've made that mistake with a water type before, so I switch into Ray to make it an easy conclusion. Oh, then in the Whirl Islands, we summon the almighty legendary Pokemon, Lugia, and Ultron is his absolute worst nightmare. Resisting both flying and psychic and smashing him with two choice specs Thunderbolts for the KO. The fact that he even survived one of those is quite telling just how bulky Lugia is. With that behind us, our final path is Victory Road itself, which I'm quite happy has no regular trainers in these games, although it does kind of feel weird. In fact, the only battle here is against our rival, not Blue. His team is immensely powerful at this point, but because the level cap goes up so high for the league, we can at least dwarf him in that regard. It's not too often you get to see a Sneasel be outsped, but Flash does it and KOs instantly with a 4 times super effective double kick. Then Golbat is handled by a super effective Thunderbolt one hit KO. In comes Meganium next, and finally we have a super effective method of dealing with this thing, as I switch in Shazam who learned the bug type signal beam which does a whopping amount of damage and takes him down in two hits with our berry helping us to get through. I switch back into Flash to handle Haunter worked out pretty well even though we got cursed, as Shadow Ball destroyed both it and his subsequent Kadabra too. His final Pokemon is then Magneton, and thank god I stopped myself as I almost instinctively clicked 4 times damage dig, but realized as a 2 turn move, Curse would end us while we're underground. So I switched into Thor at the last moment to take him down in a few low kicks for the W. With that, we've arrived at our final destination, the Indigo Plateau Pokemon League. After fulfilling the rest of our EVs and getting any remaining items and TMs we need, it's time for the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Will, the Psychic type trainer, and I had a heck of a time theory crafting for him as his team is kinda complex for us, but eventually the answer clicked. He leaves it with a Zatu, so I send out Flash. Stab Super Effective Thunderbolt is an immediate one hit KO on it, leading us off to a good start. Then, in comes Jinx. Now here, I went for Shadow Ball, but it doesn't quite do enough, and he uses Lovely Kiss and puts us to sleep. I have to risk it here though, so I stay in, and thankfully after one Psychic, we wake up and can land another to KO. And here's the key. 
I have the metronome on Flash, so Shadow Ball now increasingly gets more powerful and one hit KOs his executor from there. Then, both his Slowbro and Zatu are weak to our stab Thunderbolt, so I opt for that to take them both down too. Damn, Flash, that's some serious power. The second Elite Four member is Koga, the poison type trainer with quite a bulky team. With that said, although we don't have any super effectiveness offensively, we still have a perfect answer in Ultron who's immune to poison entirely. As a consequence, there was really no big threat here as Choice Specs Thunderbolt decimates his entire team in relatively rapid succession, the only minor annoyance being things like double team on his Crobat and minimize on his Muck. The third Elite Four member is Bruno, the fighting type expert, again one that we don't have super effectiveness against and he does have ground types too, so I decide to just try and tank it out with our bulkiest Pokemon, Ray. Knowing he'll likely try things like counter on his Hitmontop, I decide to load up on stockpiles as I know even if he went directly for dig, it's a two turn attack and we can raise our defenses beforehand. In the end, I get three of them off, being brought to two thirds in the process before two Thunderbolts take him down to just a sliver, so after he healed, he was able to hit us with another dig to almost half before we took him down. From here, with our defenses maximized, we could KO his Onyx with Surf. Then his Machamp hit us hard to 52 HP with Cross Chomp after our berry, but two Thunderbolts just got the range thanks to his own Sandstorm. With Hitmonlee out, we're now too weak to stay in, but thankfully we have another bulky threat in Shazam. And as I hoped, his high jump kick paralyzed him too, so a couple of discharges do the job with us being brought to half in the process after our berry. His final Pokemon is Hitmonchan, and Shazam tanked Ice Punch with more than half of its health remaining, so I was feeling comfortable, but our discharge did just about half and paralyzed him anyway, so I played it a bit safer and switched into Thor from there to smash him with a flurry of thunder punches even through his healing, leaving us on half health in the end. The last Elite Four member is Karen, the Dark type trainer, yet another big threat for us, but I think we have a plan for this one. She leads with a bulky Umbreon as I send out Shazam. She went for double team to start, and I hit her with super effective signal beam for just over half. She then hit a faint attack before we hit another, but it barely doesn't KO in the red. Not good, as now she heals, and even though we got a crit on our next one, we still didn't take it down, and she hit another faint attack. And as I feared, she got paralyzed by static, which you would imagine is a good thing, but she has synchronize, which paralyzes us too, meaning she now outspeeds again and hits Confuse Ray. Uh, and the para confusion hacks goes nuts here now, but eventually Shazam pulls through on half health in the end. Sheesh, I thought I could escape that. In comes Gengar next, and here I make sure to Thunder Wave it as soon as possible after we got brought to the red by Focus Blast. Here I switch in Thor as she stays paralyzed, then I get hit her with two Thunder Punches to KO, with the paralysis primarily being used to be able to outspeed Destiny Bond, which would have been devastating. In comes Houndoom next, and here I switch into our only answer, Ray, as Flamethrower hardly does anything. She then nasty plots though, which is quite dangerous as Surf barely doesn't KO in the red before her berry. She then hits a Dark Pulse and I was like, please don't flinch, that would be terrifying. But we survive in the red before her berry and make it through for the KO. Whew. From there, her Vileplume was walled quite hard by Ultron, although we got brought to half before a final flash cannon finished her. Then Victor tanked a faint attack and sucker punch before being able to Thunderbolt and fry Murkrow for the win. Well, we've made it. The final room to challenge the champion of both regions, Lance, the Dragon Master. And yep, Dragon resists Electric after all. I theorycrafted like a madman here and saw no clear path forward, but let's give it our best. He leads with a Gyarados, so I lead with Ray. I figured this is a perfect opportunity to load up on stockpiles as we do resist some of his moves. After two, I can then land a Thunderbolt to KO, taking a quarter damage in the process. In comes a massive threat though, his level 50 Dragonite which instantly outrages us, and even after the two stockpiles it did a good amount. Although our berry helps and we land a 4 times super effective Ice Beam, but he survives in the red. Oh no, my calcs were off it seems. He hits us again to a third before we can then take him down, but there's a problem, as we're way lower health than I thought we'd be as another Dragonite comes in, and our Ice Beam range seems to be off. Oh no, 
I stay in regardless, and he not only hits a 75% accuracy dragon rush, which we barely survive, but we flinch. There's no way. Thankfully, we have one remaining answer as Ultron resists dragon, but he hits two more dragon rushes somehow before Thunderbolt brings him to the red too. We're just off in every way. After he heals though, he finally misses one so we can take that damn thing down. But in comes Charizard now, and Lantern has already been used up. I go into our other bulky mon, Shazam, who tanks two Fire Fangs before hitting a Discharge, but we barely don't KO this thing as well. This is beyond brutal. After he heals, we can tank a final two Fire Fangs on just 27 HP before taking him down though. Then, in comes his third and final Dragonite, and I am running out of options. I take a long shot into Victor, but he not only hits Dragon Rush, but it nearly takes us out in one shot even with our bulk investment. Goodness gracious, I need to conserve Victor for the emergency outspeed later though, so I switch into Thor here, hoping that he'll miss one at some point, and he went for Blizzard instead, and of course hit it. How? I have no other option here though, and I know we'll need Thor later, so I decide it's time to go for the sack as I switch into Shazam, and yup, he hits another Dragon Rush to KO him. But from here, I can now send in Ultron, and he went for Thunder Wave of all things, so Thunderbolt slams him into the red. He then heals yet again, but we land another, and paralyze. No way! But he makes it through paralysis and the 75% accuracy to land another attack, and we survive on just 11 HP, but stay paralyzed. How are we having such bad luck? I take a risk and switch into Flash though, and he finally misses one so we can take him down from there. Oh man. His final Pokemon is then an Aerodactyl, and Flash is one of the few things on this earth that can outspeed it and take it down with a stab super effective 95 power Thunderbolt for the victory. I cannot believe that battle was so damn wild, but we did it. However, our journey is certainly not over yet. After getting the National Dex from Professor Oak, we can enter the SS Aqua in the Olifine City Port to take us to a new land, the Kanto region, where we arrive in Vermilion City. Now, you might be wondering why I haven't evolved Electabuzz or Magneton yet, and, well, for the former, you'll find out in a bit. But for the latter, you literally cannot evolve Magneton in this game, as they didn't program a way to do so. It's stupid, I know. Now, I always remark how easy the gym leaders in Kanto are, since you typically have a fully EV-trained team with good coverage at this point, but, uh, this time, there was one exception that made me bite my tongue. Blaine, who is relocated to the Seafoam Islands. You see, I was planning on choice specs surfing my way through with Lantern, but bad confusion luck combined with him resetting the sun at the worst possible time made me lose Flash to a sun-boosted Flare Blitz from a Rapidash as Ray got brought too low. A very painful loss. But after acquiring all 16 badges, we finally have access to Cerulean Cave. And uh, just forget about us using Flash's dead body for the Flash HM, okay? Oh my. Uh, sorry sir, just, just passing through here. Why Cerulean Cave, you might ask? Well, only here can you find the Electrizer to evolve our beastly Thor into a monster Electivire. An incredible upgrade. Oh, and along the way we also got a Luxray who I nicknamed Savage by using the Pokemon March Sinnoh Radio Swarms and he was indispensable with Intimidate in the Battle Frontier. Yup, to get TM rewards for Thor. It's time to give him some redemption for not being able to evolve until now. Well, we've arrived. Our real final destination, the perilous Mount Silver, which sparks fear in trainers worldwide. A long journey brings us to one of the final rooms where we can get arguably the best item in the game, the Expert Belt to boost super effective moves. And there is only one answer for who should get this, our newly evolved Thor the Electivire. At the summit of the mountain stands an all too familiar yet distant face, that of Red, the former champion. With no words required apparently, it's time to do battle. Red leads with his trusty level 88 Pikachu and I lead with Ray. Looks weird, I know, but there's a purpose. I immediately switch into the almighty Thor to bait the electric move on him, thereby activating our motor drive ability and raising our speed. That way, we can now outspeed him with a super effective Expert Bell boosted Earthquake to his doom. Wicked. 
In comes the bulky Snorlax next, and we've now got Brick Break, but he actually tanks it and lands a blizzard to below half before we can take him down with a second. And this hail is hurting us. In comes Lapras next, and I land a stab super effective expert bell boosted thunder punch, and it survives on a sliver somehow before landing a blizzard of its own, and down goes Thor. I was stunned. I thought for sure that would be enough. Oh no. I was kind of hoping for the Thor sweep, to be honest. As he heals, though, I can send in Savage for the two massive power Thunderfangs to KO. In comes Blastoise next, and we hit it hard with Thunderfang, but it survives on like 1 HP, then lands a Blizzard, and we survive on 42 HP, but he freezes us. Are you kidding me? Why? But then the hail takes him down, at least. In comes Venusaur next, and our only real answer here is Ultron, who's immune to the Sludge Bomb, and this was a back and forth war between the two. But we got put to sleep, and he was steadily gaining health back, but I still thought we were okay. But at the last second, he gets a crit on Giga Drain to take down Ultron. How is this happening? Not taking any chances though, as Venusaur could end us from here. I send in Victor. Yup for the explosion during a hardcore Nuzlocke to obliterate that thing. And Victor himself. It was a noble sacrifice though, as now Charizard comes in and I can send in Ray to tank the Dragon Pulse and respawn with an unholy Thunderbolt for the knockout. And the legendary win with two Pokemon remaining. That was unreal. Well, we did it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Soul Silver with only electric types. And what a journey it was with quite a frail team and very little coverage that forced me to be far more creative with my strategies than usual. I'd say our fallen Ultron was the MVP here with Ray being a close second, but all team members played pivotal roles at different points. As always, make sure to subscribe to join the Sylph Army and get us to a quarter million, and I'll see you guys next time for another challenge video.